Hey everyone, and welcome to our July live event with National Sewing Circle. Once again, we have Nikki LaFoyle back to answer all of your sewing questions. So thanks for being here, Nikki. Hey everybody, glad to be here. Of course. All right, so if you've never watched a live event before, over the next hour, Nikki is going to answer all of your sewing questions. So to uh, get those questions to Nikki, you just need to enter them into the chat box. Make sure it's the chat box that says for our live chat. The other chat box will send them to our customer service department, which we still answer, um, but we won't be able to see them live. So make sure you're using the right live chat box. But we've already got a few that have come in, so we'll start with those. So the first one is from Brenda, and she says that she has just gotten out of the hospital and now needs a lamp to sew as her eyesight is worse. What is your best recommendation that she could use so she can keep up her fast sewing pace? Yes, yeah, so lighting is super important. And of course we wish you a speedy recovery. Um, so to have good lighting, um, you know, it helps make sure you can see what you're doing, you know what you're doing, and it just makes everything go smoother and a lot easier. So you're not like, you know, trying to look at what you're doing. So having good um, either overhead lighting or lamps, However, your sewing space is set up, if you have room on your desk, a desk lamp is a great thing because you can, um, you know, if you have a lamp that's kind of movable, it has a movable neck, you can get it wherever you need it. Um, I have, so I have some natural lighting in my sewing room and I also have a desk lamp that actually clips onto uh, part of, like the side of my desk. Um, it's just an old lamp that I've got from like my grandma's house or something and it is not ideal, uh, but I know a great uh, brand of lighting, you know, that people use for sewing is Otlight, and I really need to invest in one. Ashley actually has one to show us because they make, I think they make all kinds of different configurations depending mm -hmm. on, so you can choose what's best for your sewing setup, but yeah. um, they're adjustable. Yep, absolutely. And all different sizes too. So this is the little desk size that actually, if you're looking for the perfect um, gift for someone, this was a gift uh, to me from mom. So they're, you know, something that you can get and you can get them at, at I, I think she got it at Joanne Fabrics, but I know you can get it at many craft and fabric stores and online. And so obviously this is the desk size and I know they make big floor sizes too. And it's LED light. And of course this is super adjustable. So I could put it behind my sewing machine and then bend this around, you know, to be right there on the um, the bed of the machine and it has different brightness so you can see it gets like super duper bright um, so yeah this is definitely one that I would recommend again either desk or floor but yeah having having good lighting is awesome and it's good that you have natural lighting I am in a room with zero windows so I have to have some kind of lamps or lights um, to help out but yeah that is definitely a good one yeah and the LED light is super important because it doesn't get hot so my sewing room is up in the attic, which gets real hot in the summer, and my desk lamp is not LED, so it adds heat, and I've got my iron on, so I'm like sweating as I'm trying to sew. <laughs> but LED lights are really important, and Ot light is spelled O-T-T-L-I-T-E, I believe. Yes. Yep. You can look it up. Yep, absolutely. Perfect. All right, our next question here, Mary says, I buy antique fabrics and notions. Any special criteria to evaluate their use in current projects? Um, so yeah, for antique notions, fabric and thread and stuff, you, you kind of don't know um, if they're gonna, if they're gonna, you know, go, go the distance, if they're going to be strong enough and, um, you know, especially if you're sewing apparel that's going to get worn and washed a lot. Sometimes if thread or fabric was not stored correctly, it can have weakened the fibers and the thread might snap. The fabric might just, you know, get holes a lot easier. So um, you can kind of take a look at it and you can tell if it has, if it has had UV damage a lot of times if you unroll the thread a little bit and the thread on the top of the spool is a lighter color than the thread that you uncover when you unravel it. Um, so that shows that there has been some UV damage and you can, you know, you can cut away a lot of that. The stuff that's inside the spool will have less UV damage, um, but also if it has been stored in a humid place, um, there can also be damage uh, done that way. Also with fabric, a lot of times fabric is folded, you can check for UV damage that way and see if some areas are lighter than others and the stuff that is lighter has been 
you know, the sun will leach um, color out of things. Um, so you can tell UV damage that way. Um, you can also take the thread, you can give it a little pull test. If it snaps right away, that is a bad sign and you might not want to use that. Um, you also, this might not be where you were going with this question, but uh, if you want to determine the fiber content of thread or fabric that you bought at a garage sale or at the antique store so that you know how to treat it, um, obviously, you know, there's no label on it. So how do you find out the fiber content? There's some things you can do. Um, cotton thread will have a lot more um, like loft to it. It'll be a little bit fluffier. So 100% cotton thread, you can look at it and it it's just a little bit fluffy. Um, you can also do something called the burn test. Obviously, you know, take safety precautions, um, but you can, you know, take a lighter and burn a little bit of that thread or a little bit of that fabric and different fiber contents will react differently to being burned. Obviously cotton, it'll smell a little bit like burning hair um, and it'll burn relatively easily. If it is like a um, rayon or viscose or something synthetic, it'll kind of melt. And I did this test a long time ago, so I don't remember exactly what fiber contents, you know, will react what way, but you can look that up, look up the, you know, the, the fiber burn test and find all kinds of information about it. So that's just one way to tell, you know, what you're getting or in how to use and how to treat that fabric and thread. Um, but if you have some thread that may have been damaged, you're not sure, you can also condition it. So there's that thread conditioner that I don't have any of, um, but I don't, Ashley, what was it called? The sewer's aid. Sewer's aid, yes. Yeah. So you can just like put a line of that and that can help uh, recondition that thread. Obviously, if it has been damaged, you know, for many years and it can be, you know, too far beyond repair, but that's a step that you can take to try to um, use some old thread. Absolutely. I'm just picturing like mad scientist Nikki here with like <laughs> her goggles on and she's like burning things and taking notes and seeing. But I, I mean, I have to say I have done that not in like a test way, but like we've done, I think it was even a project back at Sonu's that we did together where you'd have like that rayon fabric and you burn the edges to kind of crinkle it in and it seals those edges and you make like flowers and stuff out of them. So you can actually make some really pretty things. Um, but yeah, just be careful with the fire in your sewing room. Mm -hmm. um, so I have because when I was thinking antique fabrics and notions, like my head automatically went to like fancy old buttons and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of fabric, if it is old, would you recommend um, stabilizing it or something like that to sort of help give it a little extra life kind of? Um, I don't know that stabilizing would really help in that circumstance. It might help along seam lines mm -hmm. um, to help those seams stay strong, but if the, the fiber of the fabric is damaged or if it's just, you know, old and worn out, it's going to either pill or get holes worn through it and it'll wear through to the stabilizer anyway. So yeah. it, it might help along seam lines possibly, but otherwise, yeah, probably not. Okay. Perfect. All right. Our next question here, um, Jackie asks, I've been working on a project using a batik fabric. My new needle seems to be getting dull already. Should I be using something other than an all-purpose needle? Um, so I actually have been sewing on batik recently as well, and I just use an all-purpose needle. So if anybody doesn't know, batik is actually a, a dye method, a wax-resist dye. So they put wax on the fabric and then dye the fabric and then wash the wax away. So you get like a, a resist type dye process. Um, and you can get some really cool designs and it's all very unique. Um, but so batik is the dye process. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do with the fabric or the fibers in the fabric. So batik can be made from, traditionally it's cotton, but it can be made from all kinds of different fiber contents and blends. So depending on the blend that you have, you might want to use either a smaller gauge needle if your fabric is very thin and fine, 
um, or if it's a thicker fabric, maybe uh, a little bit of a, a larger gauge. Um, but yeah, typically I just use an all-purpose uh, size 70, 10, or I was using a, a thinner batik the other day and I used a size 68, 60 slash 8. So a little bit of a thinner gauge, uh, a little bit of finer needle to, so that I didn't leave huge holes in the fabric. Um, but yeah, otherwise I would just, yeah, pay attention to if your needle's getting dull. If, you're, if your fabric is tightly woven, it will dull your needle quicker than a looser weave. So just pay attention and change your needle out when, you know, you get the signs of a dull needle. But if that needle is working well, that size and that type of needle, and you're getting good tension, then I'd say stick with that. Just throw a new needle on. Yeah, absolutely. I would say that um, just because I know uh, who this is and what the project is that they're making, um, it's 100% quilting cotton. And sometimes it's the the quilting cotton batiks compared to other um, batiks you might buy are definitely a tighter woven compared to just your regular quilting cotton. So the only other thing that I would maybe try out is one of those microtex needles or a sharps needle or just something. Um, sometimes I feel like you get a little extra life out of it when it starts out sharper. Super sharp, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So perfect. All right, our next question here. Jen says, I'm just getting started with sewing. What are some tools you recommend that I purchase? Um. So some basic absolutely can't do without tools are uh i have pinking shears obviously that's and you know good fabric scissors so my i'm downstairs right now my sewing room is upstairs so i don't have all my stuff or i would show you but i have a good pair of ginger shears which are awesome um and i love them so those are great uh, my pinking shears which are the type of scissors that when you cut you get like a zigzag cut those are great for um finishing seam allowances and for clipping out bulk out of the seam allowances if you have a curved seam. Um, so those are great. You'll probably want to get a pair of little snips. So just like little scissors that so you can, you know, snip small things. Uh, I've got like seven pairs of those floating around. I just kind of collect them somehow. Um, so those are great to have. Uh, I also really like to cut with a rotary cutter. Uh, when I have, you know, long seams to cut, long straight seams. Um, if you're getting into, you know, some finicky curves, I like to cut with scissors, but otherwise a rotary cutter is a great way to get a nice clean cut as long as your blade is sharp. Um, those are, they can be kind of dangerous, so be very careful when you're using a rotary cutter. I've definitely cut myself using a rotary cutter before. Um, and one thing that I find myself using a lot lately um, is a stiletto and of course I don't have it but a stiletto is just a really it's like a long pointy it's like a big pin almost but it's got a handle on the end and it's good for you know if you're starting a seam and it's got some bulk in the beginning you can kind of use that stiletto to get under the presser foot and close to the needle and help that fabric get started also at the end of seams, if something is, you know, poking out, I use that to kind of poke everything back in and get everything to, you know, lie even as it's going under the presser foot. Um, so I use my stiletto all the time. Um, seam ripper, of course, is a basic one that you, unfortunately, everyone needs. Um, and, you know, a tip that I have heard is get yourself a nice seam ripper get a pretty seam ripper so that when you have to rip out a seam, it'll be easy for you to do because it's sharp and it's pretty to hold on to. So it won't make you so mad that you have to be <laughs> ripping out a seam. So Perfect. I have I have a nice golden seam ripper that Pam DeMore gave me that I think of her every time I use it. Um, you have a gold stiletto too. So you have a gold line of these tools. Yeah, to they're matching. Pam gave me my stiletto yep. too. I remember I was there for that day. <laughs> um, but yeah, other than that, like, you know, make sure you've got an array of needles so that, um, you can change your needle out when you need to, of course, because that makes everything easier to have a good sharp needle. Um, so get a stock of all purpose needles, um, or universal needles mm -hmm. and, um, 
yeah, if you're if you're sewing off of commercial patterns, you'll need chalk tracing paper to trace your um, your marks off onto your fabric. Um, but yeah, those are some of my favorites. Yeah, just yep. uh, that stiletto, thinking shears. So those are some basics. It's funny because we have um, usually differing opinions on lots of things. But again, once again, on tools, too, because the first thing you mentioned was pinking chairs. And I had a pair once and I think I used them once and then I gave them to my mom. So I'm like, I'm never going to use these again. And I've never needed them. So, I mean, it's just all in like sort of what you sew um, and what you, you know, use. I also have a stiletto somewhere, but um, I have a three year old. So I hit it because I didn't want him to. And now I don't know where it is. So I also, I use, so I use my snips for lots of things. So my snips double as snips, uh, stiletto, seam ripper. I don't even have a seam ripper any, anywhere. I just use my little snips for everything. So if, like you can find, if you're getting overwhelmed with like, there's too many things to have to buy, you know, and I don't want to spend a bunch of money, try and find something that can be, you know, sold, serve multiple purposes. And then like, if you decide, okay, maybe I do need a seam ripper because I'm using it all the time, then, you know, branch out and get more things. But I do like those multi-purpose tools. Mm -hmm, for sure. All right, our next one here. I like to make patterns smaller, but find the one-eighth a hard measurement to cut and or make into one half. So what would be your tips for making patterns smaller? Um, so to make patterns smaller, so like to size, to just like – go down a size. I'm going to say, yeah, grade down the size. Yeah. So for grading patterns down, if you know, you get to the, to the smallest size and you need to go even smaller, um, to grade down, there's different methods of grading. So you can, um, you can trace off the pattern, the smallest size, and you can, uh, slash and kind of shrink everything in. And if it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, it's, it's fairly easy to do once you learn the technique. Um, but it's, you want to put a couple of lines so that you're not just, you know, slashing in one area, you know, one cut horizontal and vertical and squeezing it in. You want to, you want to, um, to make even cuts, at least two, um, and you want to put your cuts where there are, like if you've got, if you're doing it to a bodice, you want to put a slash on the um, the arm side line so that, that that can get shrunk down. And there are formulas on, you know, where to put the slashes and how many slashes to put in, you know, different types of patterns. Because if you're doing a skirt, it's easier to grade that down rather than a bodice because there's more, you know, fitting areas in a bodice. Um, so there are formulas that you can look up so you can do the slashes and, you know, kind of shrink things down and trace off, or you can, um, trace off that pattern onto like tissue paper and you can fold the dart lines in and kind of pin it to yourself and use a marker to, you know, mark where those, um, those cut lines should be on your own body. Because sometimes if you grade something down, you know, you grade it down evenly in all areas, but, you know, everyone's body is different. So you might not need to take it down or take it in so much in one area versus another. So, so getting that tissue paper pattern to fit on yourself or even cutting out a muslin if you have, some, you know, extra fabric that's similar to the fabric you're going to use for the project, you can cut it out in that fabric and you know baste it together and put it on yourself so that you can see you know where you need uh, where how much you need to take out of different areas and mark it on the muslin and then you can transfer those markings onto the pattern so different ways to do it depending on how much time you have and how important the project is to you but I would encourage you to look up that uh, the formula for grading because it's actually a really useful skill to have. And when I learned how to do it, um, I was kind of shocked by how easy it was to do because mm -hmm. um, it looks like it might be complicated, but it's really not. Just knowing where to put those slashes 
um, to cut and you know shrink things down. Yeah, absolutely. And if it's something like you said, if it's, it's how important the project is, but especially if it's a garment and you want to wear it and feel good about it and have it look nice, you know, it's definitely worth putting in that extra effort um, to, to make it fit and look right the way you want it to. So perfect. All right, our next one here, um, Kelsey asks, any tips for keeping my scissors sharp? Well, um, your scissors are going to dull no matter what, but um, I guess the number one tip for keeping your scissors sharp is don't let anyone else touch them. Don't <laughs> let anyone cut paper with them. I keep my, my fabric scissors like upstairs in a drawer so nobody can touch them. Uh, Cause I know my daughter cut with them if she she got her hand on them. So cutting paper with your will obviously dull your scissors faster. Also fabrics that will your scissors they dull your knee faster. So like um, felt um, things that are like uh, faux leather um, things that are kind of hard to cut through. Uh, batting will kind of dull your needle a little bit faster. Uh, so keep an eye on that. Um, if you find that your your scissors are starting to um, not make that nice shh, shh sound as you're cutting through fabric, um, give them a quick sharpen. And that's super easy to do. Just take some tin foil, fold it three, four times so you get a decent thickness and just snip through five or six times with your scissors and that will um, just give it a, a quick sharpen. And if you do that before they get real, real dull, you know, you can just maintain them that way. If they're super dull, uh, you might have to, you know, get one of those scissor sharpeners where you kind of do that thing to them or take them to somebody. But just to maintain, that tinfoil trick is all I have used with my Ginger scissors and it's kept them really nice and sharp like a samurai blade. Perfect. That's, that's funny. That's um, actually we're on the same page. That's a tip that I was going to share too. And we're actually going to do a Facebook Live on Monday on the National Sewing Circle um, page. And I'm going to talk about some other ways to keep your scissors sharp and your rotary cutter blades sharp and your needles, uh, pins, things like that. And aluminum foil, tin foil is one of those things. And we actually have a free downloadable guide um, right now available that has all those same ways and other additional tips on how to keep things sharp. So perfect. I like that we're on the same page with that. All right, our next one here, Nancy says, what size needle do I use to machine sew binding onto a quilt? Um, so sewing binding onto a quilt, I would say, um, a size, you know, 70, 10 universal needle would do just fine. Um, the, you know, the size needle that you use really depends on the fabric that you're using. So quilting cotton to go through quilting cotton and batting, uh, just a mid size universal needle, I think is fine. Yep. Absolutely. I honestly use the exact same needle that I use to piece the quilt to stitch the binding on. So everything should all be the same. So. All right. And next one here, what thread should I use on stretch PVC? So uh, any stretch fabric, you are going to want to use a ballpoint needle, some variety of ballpoint needles. So they have needles called ballpoint. They have needles that are called this is how I tell I use that needle, but these jersey needles, you know, fabric, jersey needle, ballpoint needle, or stretch needle, those are all uh, good needles to use on stretch fabrics because they are, um, instead of being a really, really sharp tip, they're slightly rounded at the tip, still very sharp, they will poke you. Um, but instead of cutting through those fibers as the needle goes through the fabric, it kind of nestles in between that knit structure of the fabric. And, you know, even if the fabric is not a knit, if it is a woven, but it has, you know, a lot of um, elastic blended into the fiber content, you'd still want to use that, um, that ballpoint jersey or the stretch needle um, so that it, it minimizes the cutting of the fibers as it goes through the fabric. 
And a stretch needle is, um, is designed for use on those super duper stretchy, like Lycra type fabrics that are, you know, super dance wear and things like that are, that are super stretchy. So the stretch needle is a good one to use for that. Perfect. Uh, speaking of needles, um, Brenda says, any secrets to easier threading of my, my needle on my machine? I know better light will help, but any other tips or tricks that would help? Yeah. So, um, my, my FOF machine has the threader. Some of them have automatic a button and it like shoots it through. This doesn't have that, but it has um, this thing where it's like a little lever that you pull down and it goes, it's got the little, like a little metal hook that goes through the hole of the needle and you put your thread in that and it pulls it back. Um, I love that function, but I was using a smaller gauge needle, the 60 size 60 slash eight needle I was talking about. And the needle threader wouldn't fit through the eye of that needle. So I had to manually thread my needle, um, which <laughs> I had gotten used to my automatic needle thread. I was like, oh, I gotta do it by hand again. Um, I'm so spoiled. But so to thread that needle, um, you wanna make sure the end of your thread is, it doesn't have any you know fluff coming off of it. So I usually clip you know, a little bit of that thread off. And then I you get a little bit of spit and I put it on the end of the thread and then put a little bit of spit on the back of your needle too, because the, the water will attract each other. So if you, so the water from the back of the needle attracts the water from your thread in theory. <laughs> I just found that that trick always helps me thread my needle mm -hmm. easy, no problem every time. So that's my trick. I've heard of that too, but that still goes back to the whole mad scientist Nikki. You know, I still think we're figuring out how to do all these little things too. Um, but I was going to say the other thing um, that, so I've had machines that have the pull down lever and I can never get those to work. I have literally never gotten it to work. The one I have now, it is just the fancy push button and it just does it. Um, but you can still, you know, they come usually with hand sewing needles, but those old school, they look like little tin foil. Um, mm -hmm dime almost and it's got that loop you can still use that to thread the machine on your or the needle on your machine it doesn't have to just be for hand sewing so yeah so you just spread open the little wire part and stick that through and that'll easily yeah so something like that too perfect see i'm glad you just have things right there ready to show love it all right um here is a question that's perfect for you right up your alley i know you love to talk about this so Alma wants to know, is there a quick tip to know the correct thread tension for specific fabric types? I'm asking before um, I've done any research. Yes. So I'll, I'll help you with your research here so you get a leg up before you have to do any testing of your own. So um, thinner fabrics require a higher, so a tighter tension uh, than thicker fabrics. So thicker fabrics, you're going to want to dial down your tension to a lower number because, you know, the higher the tension, the tighter those threads are going to uh, link together. So the thicker fabrics require more room to lie between those threads as it makes that stitch. So a lofty fabric like um, fleece, felt, minky, um, fur, something like that is going to require a looser tension than, you know, a nice fine fabric like a chiffon or a silk or even a, a lawn or, you know, a, a lightweight cotton. Um, so tighter, um, tighter tensions for those lightweight fabrics, a higher number on your tension dial. But of course, you want to test that because it also depends on your machine's timing. Um, sometimes older machines you'll find as you go along, it depends on also the sharpness of your needle. So as your needle's getting duller, you might need to change the tension a little bit. And you'll find that when the needle gets too dull to make a good connection with the bottom thread, you're going to start having lots of problems. So change out your needle. But when you start testing your tension, 
I recommend starting with a new needle so you get an accurate, you know, read on what your tension should be for that fabric. But I know that when I'm switching fabrics, I can, I can kind of eyeball it and gauge, okay, I'm switching from a thinner fabric to a thicker fabric. I know I'm going to have to loosen my tension a little bit. So I'll loosen it up a little bit before I even test it. But when you're changing your needle tension, you want to go small increments because you don't want to go, you know, way too far and then have to come back. Um, so I usually go half increments. So I'll go from three to three and a half, test it, and then go to four. Um, and if you really want to get, get a good visual on what's going on with your tension, you can thread your needle in a thread that's a high contrast both to your fabric and to your bobbin thread so that you can sew a little bit, take it out, look at it, and really see what's going on. Yeah, perfect. All right, our next one here, um, Veronica asks, the presser foot area started to sound like the stitches are dropping. Is there something that you could maybe recommend that might be happening or something that she should fix? Yes, this is actually a good tie-in to what I was just talking about because it sounds like, uh, it sounds like a dull needle to me um because when your needle starts getting dull you'll start getting skip stitches because the needle is too dull it's having a hard time making it through the fabric to get down to that bobbin thread to make that connection in time so i would recommend putting a new needle on and trying it out and if that doesn't clear up that problem you might want to take a look at um, the combination of thread and fabric that you're using, thread and needle and fabric, because if you're using a, a thread that is too thick for the eye of your needle, that can throw off your tension too. So if you're using a thread that is a little bit thicker, like a heavyweight thread or a top stitch thread, um, you'll use a large eye, such as a dental, um, or a top stitch needle that'll be a large metallic needle also a larger eye. So that's, if you have one of those lying around, you can try that as well. But if your tension was fine and all of a sudden it's just started sounding like you're skipping stitches, that sounds definitely sounds like a dull needle to me. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So we have like sounds of things and <laughs> water reactions, uh, how things smell when they burn up. <laughs> Mad science. All right. <laughs> Next one here, uh, a common question we get a lot, we get this, whether it's a sewing question, a quilting question, it's kind of one of those, um, gets debated a lot, but should I wash my fabric before I cut it? Um, I say yes. <laughs> I say definitely you should because here's why. So when you get fabric from the store, um, you know, it, it came from the manufacturer and the manufacturer you know, they just dyed it. And even if, you know, they washed it afterward, which I don't know that they did. Um, a lot of times they will, they'll treat it with something to protect the fabric for shipping from UV until it gets purchased. And that is called sizing. It's kind of confusing, but um, you want to get rid of all of that stuff uh, an excess dye before you start working with it um, so that, you know, you know exactly what you're working with when you start cutting your fabric out and also to pre-shrink your fabric because if the fabric is going to shrink at all, it's going to be in that first washing. So you want to wash that fabric as you will wash the finished product. So if it's a garment and you want to just throw it in, you know, cold water, wash, whatever, however you do it, do that with the fabric um, and that'll get rid of that sizing. It'll pre-shrink it. Uh, you know, if it's going to shrink at all, it'll do it then so that when you dry it and you press it and you go to cut it out, it's not going to, the, the fibers aren't going to move anymore. It's not going to shrink anymore. So if you were to, you know, cut it and then wash it, you know, if you cut a five inch square and then you washed it, it might be four and three quarter inch square now. And then, you know, it's not the right size for you. So I recommend washing it first. Um, and when you go to wash it, what I always do is I fold it um, so that the raw edges are together and I baste the raw edges and I 
I backstitch at each end to keep that basting stitch in. And that just keeps it from becoming a big jumbled mess, especially if it's a, like a, a woven fabric that's prone to fraying so that it won't fray all over in your washer and your dryer and get big clumps of threads and get all tangled together. That basting seam will hold that together um, and keep it nice and prevent it from you know, fraying too much and becoming a huge mess. So that is my take on it. Perfect. I like it. All right, our next one here, um, Eric says, very beginner, very beginning sewer here. I continue to have issues when hand sewing. I do not double the thread. My issue is that every few times of pulling the needle through the fabric, making my stitch, the thread comes out of the eye of the needle and I have to re-thread the needle. I mostly have been sewing binding on a quilt. Okay, um, that is so frustrating, isn't it? <laughs> I hate that. Um, I, I would recommend... Um, just getting a, a long enough piece of thread in your needle, you know, it's just kind of a balance there. You don't want it too long because then it's going to get tangled up when you're, when you're sewing, but long enough that you can make sure you keep that end of the thread far enough away from the eye that it's not going to slip out. So when I start hand sewing, if I'm not going to double up the thread, I like to, um, so you're not the end, only one end if you're not doubling it up, but I kind of keep the needle kind of in the middle of the thread anyway, just like that much off of center um, so that when I pull it through, I have a pretty long tail on the back of my needle. So it's a pretty good safety to make sure that that thread isn't going to slip, slip out of the eye. And you have to move the thread a little bit every so often because you'll pull a stitch and then you're your doubled thread isn't going to come through. So you have to kind of pull the needle a little bit further along on the thread and to keep going. But yeah, give yourself a, a good tail and just pay attention to where that thread end is. And um, that should help a little bit, but yeah, it's, it happens sometimes to me for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I do the same thing. Like even you like said, you pretty much cut it as if you were going to double it anyway. And then that way, I mean, if, if you were getting used to every few stitches having to re-thread your needle, just every few stitches having to pull that needle up a little more, it's still going to be better than having to re-thread it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Sydney says, I cut triangles and they always turn out with one side larger than the other. I bought all kinds of rulers, but still have had no luck. Please help. Yeah. So um, to cut triangles evenly, I know they do make templates like template rulers of triangles um, but to have the exact size that you need what you could do is actually draw your triangle on paper like cardstock is a good template type paper you can draw your triangle and then use that as a template um, but to get you know the angle of each corner correct gosh let's see um, you can just like do trial and error to get it right. Or you can, what are those called? A compass? The, the well, little compass thing is for drawing circles though, right? Um, but don't, can, can't We're you We're not doing like, geometry, can you tell? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Math is No, not so I would say, I definitely, so I do a lot of, of quilting as well, right? So they have so many different types of quilting, triangle rulers, triangle templates, and you can definitely print off any size. Um, or like I said, make your own template. But sometimes if I've, I'm having trouble with something and say it's going to be, again, I don't do, do geometry. So I don't I don't know what type of triangle this would be, right? But I'll, I'll cut out a triangle like I would cut out a heart, right? I'm going to fold it in half and then cut it. Okay. So then when I open it up, I know that both those sides are exactly the same. So whether or not that gets me the exact size, you're still going to need to make your template on the half, you know, so you can, you can draw your triangle the size you want it to be, go ahead and either fold it in half or just cut it in half, your template, and then place that on the fold of your fabric. And then that way, you know, both sides are exactly the same. Right. And to get a triangle where all the angles are equal, mm -hmm. you would, you would draw the, the line that is halved to half of the size of the line that is Long. Yeah. Yeah. Equilateral work. triangle. That one I know. But yeah, I would, I would honestly just, I'm all about 
simple, quick Google search, you could be like, I need a three inch triangle or whatever size you need. And then just print that off, use that to make your template and then just go from there. But yeah, make it as easy as possible. Yeah. Rather than trying to, there's no way I would like lay it on my cutting mat and try and figure out the math with my ruler. And I'd waste so much fabric <laughs> that way. There's no way. But, all right. The next one, um, Jenna asks, when I sew, sometimes my thread comes out of the tensions at the top of the machine. It's super frustrating when this happens because I have to start my stitch over. Any idea on why this happens? Um, That's a good question. I have not come across that happening before. My only guess would be when you thread your machine, it's not quite getting locked in to one of those because this this um, point of tension up here that you thread it through, it has, you know, you, you pull it in and then it's got like a little keyhole thing to kind of let the thread rest in there and kind of lock it in to make sure it doesn't slip out when that goes up and down. So my only guess might be that maybe that's not going all the way into that um or these these tension discs over here maybe you know maybe your thread's not you know as you're threading it maybe it's not going exactly in the right spot um so i'd say just double check that um sometimes you know when i'm threading my machine i'm on autopilot i've done it eight thousand million times and so i'm not really paying attention to what i'm doing it's just like muscle memory and you know something just doesn't go where it's supposed to and then it's I'll know immediately because it doesn't sew right and I have to redo it. So close attention to where you're going as you're threading it. Um, that'd be my best guess. Yeah. Is there, because um, I know you can obviously adjust the needle tension and things like that, but there's, I, mean, I, I don't know this or not, but is there a way to, could that have accidentally gotten loosened to the point where, or tightened to the point where they're now touching and the thread isn't, getting into the between the two parts where it's supposed to be like there's something like that yeah that is a good point possibly maybe they got uh, pressed together and now they're stuck together and so your needle or your thread isn't getting in between those tension discs so yeah take a close look at the tension discs um turn your dial and see if you can see those tension discs moving see if you know get a thread in there and see if you can feel anything moving around in there but yeah that's a that's a good idea too something might have gone wrong with those tension discs and either they're they're um so far apart that they're not touching the thread at all and they're you know those discs aren't moving or they're stuck together something like that yeah, yeah. that's also a possibility or you and you've even talked about this before you've um not necessarily the, the discs, but the, the front tension part, you take a piece of fabric and you clean that out, right? Because I mean, any, any if you're using linty thread and you have to clean out your bobbin area, you have to clean out everywhere that that thread has touched. So maybe, you know, lint buildup and things like that have also gotten your tension discs sort of stuck. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. perfect. All right, so lots of things to try there. So, all right, our next one here, um, I'm replacing a tent zipper. The length I need is 75 inches, but all I could find was 100 inches. How do I cut the excess off? And more importantly, how do I secure the cut end? I have read about how to do it, but I'm not sure that I understand it. Yes. So um, if, if the end of the zipper is just going to end in a stop, it's fairly easy to do. And I mean, even if the zipper, you know, you want the parts of the zipper to come apart completely. Um, I haven't done that before, so I'll do my best to kind of explain. But um, so if you're just gonna like unzip it like a tent door or something and the zipper doesn't need to come undone all the way, you can, um, you can like create a new zipper stop with thread. So you can measure out the length that you need and use thread um, like hand stitch yourself a new zipper stop wherever you need to. And if that, if the zipper teeth are metal, you're, you're going to need to take pliers and pull those teeth off right below, um, right below your new zipper stop so that you can cut that zipper tape. Uh, if it is nylon teeth, 
uh, you can just cut through with your scissors, no problem. Um, and, you know, same thing, create yourself a new zipper, stop wherever you need to uh, with, you know, stitch through with either your hand sewing needle or if it's a, a nylon zipper, you can even do a zigzag stitch across those teeth to lock those um, to make sure your zipper pull isn't going to come right off the end. Um, but, you know, go back and forth six, eight times to make sure you've got a good thick zipper stop there and tie it off. But if you needed, to, if you needed those, um, those zipper tape pieces to come completely off, like in a, z a sleeping bag zipper that they cut, they, you know, come completely off so that it can open up completely. Um, I do believe there that you're able to put on um, new zipper stops on the bottom of each of those. And I don't know if you have to like buy a crimper to put metal pieces on the bottom or if you can do it the same way and just do a thread stop. I'm not entirely sure about that. Any insight, Ashley? Well, I know they make, um, and I just, I haven't played around with them a whole lot, but they're, they're called like zipper repair kits and they come with everything that you need to either replace a zipper pull, replace a zipper stop, replace zipper tooth, you know, any of those kind of things. And you can get them in, they generally come in the metal version because those are the ones where it comes with little, um, essentially pliers, right, that, that allow you to reclamp on those teeth and stuff like that. When it comes to those coil zippers, there's really just not a whole lot you can do to, you know, recoil a coil zipper. Um, so it's generally the metal ones, but usually I would say something like a tent probably has a heavy duty metal zipper. So look for zipper repair kits. Um, and I guess if it comes down to it and you have to replace the stop, the part that you cut off of your zipper tape, if you can use pliers and open up that zipper stop and take it off and then put it back on where you need it now and just hammer it back in or clamp it back in, you might be able to sort of use what you've cut off um, to create what you need. So I'd go one of those two routes, either play around with it yourself using what you cut off or yeah, a zipper repair kit. So. All right, our next question here, um, what fabric is best for making my own dish towels? Uh, the staff at my fabric store draws a blank when I ask them. Um, so dish towels. Um, so I have, uh, my dish towels are ticking fabric, which is that kind of tightly woven. Usually it has like a blue stripe on the white fabric. That's your typical ticking fabric. And those are not as absorbent as like the terry cloth towels. And you know, the big fluffy terry cloth is typically like bath towels. But I think, you know, I have towels that are that kind of terry cloth, but they're less of a loft. Mm -hmm. And they have like, I don't know if it's the, di the diamond stamped on them or if it's like a different weave. I actually haven't looked that close uh, at them to s determine their weave, but um, those those ticking towels is you know kind of a common fabric for that. Otherwise, I would say like a kind of terry cloth type fabric. Yep, absolutely, I agree. All right, our next one here. Um, Tanisha says, "How do you know when your sewing machine needs the timing set, and how do you do that?" So the timing is like an inner component on your machine. And if you have, if your tension is bad, uh, you know, if you're getting skip stitches or thread nests, or just, you can't get the tension, no matter, you can't get the tension right, no matter what you do, it might be a timing issue, but you have a whole lot of things that you can go through before you come to the conclusion that it's a timing issue. So you've got kinds of, you know, surf stuff that it might be. You can mess with your bobbin tension um, or to that. And if it is a timing issue, um, I would suggest taking it to a sewing machine repairman person um, because I, I mean, I would have to go into the, into the belly of my sewing machine, like take it apart. And I'm not, you know, I'm not that. I can't get that deep into the sewing machine. Um, and I would tr want to trust, get it to somebody, you know, a trusted professional, um, because that's like 
the very basic manufacturing of the sewing machine is how that timing is set. So if you have um, a bobbin case where, you know, you have the, the thing that actually comes out for you to put the bobbin in and then you put it back in, if that gets damaged at all, um, that is something that can lead to a timing issue um, because, it, you know, it's just an extra moving part that is kind of, you know, delicate. And if you drop it on a hard floor or something, uh, something can get thrown out of whack. So I would say that it's more likely for a machine like that to have a timing issue than a machine like this where the bobbin just drops in. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff that you can do first before it gets to a timing issue. But if you get there and conclude that it's timing, I recommend a professional. I absolutely agree. And it's one of those things where if your timing is off on your machine to where it needs to be fixed by a professional, you'll know it. So that's one thing that I've done it before and it was on, I was borrowing my grandma's old singer machine. Like it had dials and stuff. It was just like super, super old. And I was trying to sew through a couple layers of corduroy actually on a jacket. And because it was so thick and I probably wasn't using the right needle, but it's like you essentially you can throw the timing off. So you can do it by trying to go through something too thick, by hitting a pin, um, things like that. And it'll, you'll kind of hear it happen. And it's like it's, it, it moves that bobbin case to now it, it physically will not sew. So like your, you know, your bobbin case rotates around when you're sewing and your needle has to come down in a certain spot. And it's like I would use the hand wheel, wheel and the needle was just hitting the bobbin case. It didn't, you know, and, the, and there's just, for me at that point, there's no way to fix that. So you know when the timing is off, and that was definitely a take it to a professional to have them fix it kind of issue. But they can. They know exactly you know how to do it, and it's a fairly easy fix for them, I guess. But, yeah, definitely beyond what I could handle. <laughs> All right. Uh, Valerie wants to know, any tips on sharpening pinking shears? Can I do it the same way I sharpen my scissors? Um, I don't think you can do it the same way. I don't think cutting through tin foil will do it it might help ashley's not sure i'm not sure you know me and the pinking shears that i use that one time i'm not very versed in pinking shears but i feel like the whole thing about with the tin foil is you're trying to sort of i don't want to say straighten back out that edge but it kind of you know dulls it a little bit so i think it would still help it i don't know that it's going to do as good as your regular scissor but it's definitely going to do better than nothing Right. Yeah. If they're super dull and they're just useless in cutting your fabric, mm -hmm. might as well try it. Yeah. Yep. Otherwise they become paper scissors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. We have a guest that commented that one tip to keeping scissors sharp is to keep them in an airtight container as air corrodes the metal. Same is true for rotary cutters and the aluminum foil trick works great. I had never heard that about That's that. A I hadn't either, but let me... Ah, uh, Scientist Nikki, I thought you would know about this. It, it does make perfect sense to me, though, and especially if you live in a hid environment, I would think that yeah. keeping it stored it would be a great idea. Yeah, perfect. All right, um, we have a follow-up on the washing of the fabric. Um, do you need to sew a zigzag stitch around the edge before washing? So where you're talking about basting the edges, but would you... Do it on um, all of them. Um, no, I do not typically finish off the raw edges. Um, just basting those raw edges together is enough. And you can baste them together fairly close, like half inch, maybe a little bit less to kind of lock those in. Um, you don't need to, you know, completely finish off the edges. That'd be a little bit overkill and, you know, waste some thread and some time. I find that the basting stitch close-ish to the edge is enough to lock those in to keep you from getting a huge, messy lump of threads coming off in the wash. Yep. Perfect. All right. We have a clarification here from Sydney um, who was talking about cutting the triangles. And she wants to clarify that she meant she was having trouble cutting half square triangles. And do you have any further tips for her? Okay. So half square triangles they would be a little bit more complicated because all of the angles, well, one angle would be a right angle and the other angles would be the same as each other. And it would be 45 degree angles. Um, yeah. 
I don't have any tips off the top of my head because that's not something that I really do much because I, I don't do much piecing. Um, I'm going to say just because, so I have definitely cut a million half square triangles probably over the last several years. And just, it all comes down to how you want it to put, to get, put it together. But I never, I try to avoid cutting the triangle. So if I'm going to make half square triangles, I'm starting with two squares and putting them together. I'm, you know, marking my line down the middle of that square, sewing a quarter inch on either side, cutting apart along that line, opening it up, and there's my half square triangle. And I didn't have to actually cut a triangle at all. Same thing is people cut half square triangles um, in use in making flying geese. Same thing, I'm gonna avoid that and try and make a flying geese with a rectangle and two small squares. Same thing, marking down that center and sewing on that line. So I'm gonna say if you're having issues with half square triangles, just avoid the triangle part um, and try and start with squares. Um, but of course we have uh, our sister site, National mm -hmm. Filter Circle, and we have so many resources and videos and tips and tricks and things on that site as well um, for specifically working with half square triangles and um, more quilting related tips. So definitely check that out um, for some more information other than my quick um, how to do it with squares. Uh, but our next one here, uh, <laughs> yeah, Gina says, um, sometimes when I'm sewing, something happens with the bobbin that it jams and it brings up more than just the bobbin thread, more of a mess comes up and it's stuck. Um, is this a problem with my machine, my bobbin, my tension? Uh, what is it? Um, yes. Um, maybe all of those. And sometimes it might be one, sometimes it might be another. So this actually happened to me the other day at, when I was, I was doing an applique. So I had a satin stitch on my machine. So I had a really, you know, small zigzag stitch and it was just kind of random, kind of weird. It just pulled up a bunch of different, a bunch more thread. And I thought that it was, you know, going through that, um, my adhesive for my applique might have got a little gummy on my needle. So I wiped that down. And I also, I lowered my machine speed a little bit. Um, because sometimes if you're sewing too fast, uh, that's more in skip stitches. But sometimes if you're sewing too fast, it can throw off your tension and give you problems too. So I just lowered my machine speed a little bit, cleaned off my needle. Um, if, it hap if it's happening consistently, like fairly consistently, you might want to um, play around also with the type of needle you're using, the type and the size because that plays into tension a lot as well. So you can try um, try using um, a, a needle with a different sized eye. I would say a smaller eye would make sense to me uh, or a smaller needle, but um, you know, there are a lot of things that go into getting good tension. And sometimes when something's not right, um, you know, you just kind of have to play around a little bit and see, you know, try one thing and see if it fixes the issue. Um, but yeah, try, try a different needle. Um, just make sure that your, the thread that you're using is appropriate for your needle size, uh, making sure the needle size is appropriate for your fabric thickness and, you know, the type of weave. Um, you can, uh, if, if your tension is otherwise good if the tension you know looks good on your seam um i'd say you can you know leave that alone because i think that that would be okay um sometimes strangely the foot that you're using affects the tension as well the foot in combination with you know the needle and the thread um, I was using a different foot on one of my old machines one time and I could not do, I don't even remember what stitch it was, I, but I couldn't do a certain type of stitch with my roller foot. The tension just would not work. So as soon as I put my regular foot back on, I could do that stitch with all of my settings the same, just that foot, I don't know if the foot made push down on the fabric or something. It was like a thicker foot. I don't know. It didn't come with my machine. So maybe that had something to do with it. It fit on, but 
The red, oh, yeah. it, was the, it was the roller foot on the bottom of your faux leather bag with the top yeah. stitch thread, and it just wouldn't it, work. That's so. what it was. The top stitch thread, the combination of top stitch thread and roller foot, it just absolutely would not work. I was getting skip stitches every other stitch, and I was like sweating and screaming <laughs> and crying at the same time because, you know, you guys were, we were waiting. We had cameras on you, and we were like, come on, Nikki, let's go. So. That was, a, that was a tense afternoon, but we got it got figured it, out though. Got it figured out. So yeah, sometimes it's just something like that. Uh, also make sure you're using the right bobbin size for your machine because um, bobbins come in different heights. And if you had, you know, one floating around from an old machine and you popped it in, uh, if it's not the right size, it's going to throw off all kinds of things. So there's, you know, some things to try. Yeah. And there's definitely um, deceivingly more bobbins out there than you'd think there would be. Um, but we actually have a couple of really good videos on National Sewing Circle. ZJ uh, takes you through all of the different sizes, styles, types, um, all those kind of things. Um, so definitely some additional resources there. Um, but we're about out of time here, but I do have one more question I want to get to um, because they say that sometimes a seam has come undone after I've been using my item. I'm not always consistent with knotting my stitches when I finish, so I end up with several little knots trailing off the fabric. So what is the best way to keep my stitches from coming undone? So if you are, um, if you're machine stitching, you can use the back stitch function on your machine and that's pretty good at um, at locking your stitches sometimes if it's a you know a stress point I will or if it's something that um, that I don't want little thread tails showing on the right side I will I'll pull on the bobbin thread and pull that needle thread to the wrong side of the fabric mm -hmm. and then I'll just tie a little knot a little you know, by hand, I'll do a double knot and just kind of pull that tight to the, just an extra um, security and so that you know that that's not going to come undone. And then if you really want to also, um, sometimes I'll do this, I'll put some fray check on the knot or on, you know, the little bundle of backstitch threads and that helps to it's kind of like glue. It kind of helps lock that, those threads in and it, it dries very, you know, soft. So it's not like it's scratchy on your skin or anything. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's, that's what I do. And it, to pull those threads to the wrong side and tie them off takes a little bit of extra time. Um, but when it's, you know, especially if it's a stress point on the garment or the bag or whatever, um, making sure that those stitches are super locked in is a good idea. Yeah. Absolutely. Perfect. Well, I want to thank you for um, being here to answer all of our sewing questions. And I do want to tell everyone that we do have a free download that you can download right now. And it's called the Sewing from the Comfort of Your Home Download. And it's a fun little calendar uh, that's going to help get you either motivated to finish a project or to sort of start and finish a project. So it's an entire week um, and each day it gives you something to do. So you're going to plan a project on Monday. You're going to tackle it on Tuesday, work on it on Wednesday. We have a kind of a theme for each day. And so again, it's motivation to either, you know, say, learn something new, pick something you want to make and finish in a week. You pick it on Monday and you finish it by Sunday. And then of course, share it um, and use the hashtag that's on the calendar so we can all see um, what project you made. But it's also a great way to finish up a project. So Nikki, do you have a project you would finish up using this calendar? What are you working on? Um, I'm making masks for all my family and friends. So Perfect. That would be a good way for me to, you know, set a quantity of masks to make mm -hmm. in the week. Yeah, absolutely. So no matter what uh, what project you're working on, what you want to finish up or what you want to maybe learn as a new skill, download this uh, guide and use it to sort of help get you motivated to do it. So perfect. And again, thank you so much for, for being here to talk sewing with us over the last hour. My pleasure.